Hola, bienvenidos, bienvenidas. Welcome, everyone. I'm Patrick Butler. I am the senior vice president of the International Center for Journalists, also known as ICFJ. Thank you for joining us for this very important discussion about the reprehensible detention of the Guatemalan journalism icon, Jose Ruben Zamoro. We'll also be talking about the deteriorating conditions for media freedom in Central America. The decision of the Guatemalan government to arrest Jose Ruben is not meant only to silence him, but also to send a message to journalists at El Periódico and around the country. If you report truthfully about this government, you will pay a price. Jose Ruben has been brutally attacked before and he has never been silenced. We hope that by raising awareness about this issue, we can amplify his voice and the voices of all journalists in the region who are holding their governments to account. Jose Ruben won the IF, ICFJ's prestigious Knight International Journalism Award in 2003. Two of our panelists have also won this award. Our wonderful moderator, Carmen Aristegui from Mexico, won this award in 2016. And the pioneering Carlos Dada of El Salvador won this year. We are grateful to the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation for sponsoring these awards and for its steadfast support of ICFJ and, of course, for co-sponsoring today's event. I'd also like to thank our other co-sponsors, the Inter-American Press Association and the Committee to Protect Journalists. And now, I'd like to turn this over to Carmen Aristegui so she can guide us through this discussion. Carmen. Thank you, Patrick, for that introduction. Thank you for the efforts made by the ICFJ. Thank you for connecting throughout this internet broadcast. And yes, what we want to do is open a broad debate about what's going on with respect to Jose Ruben Zamora and Guatemala, the status of things in Guatemala. And this panel will also allow us to open up this discussion about what's happening in the region with respect to freedom of expression and also uh, the measures taken by governments against journalists. Now we're going to focus on what's going on with Jose Ruben Zamora. Um, now we're going to open up our panel and hear from those who are with us. We have Lucy Chai, the du Deputy Director of El Periódico in Guatemala, one of the most important media outlets in the country, which has been characterized by the ex extraordinary investigations revealing corruption and demanding accountability from authorities. She previously served as as editor in chief of El Periodico. Thank you, Lucy, and welcome. Thank you, Carmen. Good afternoon to everyone here with us. Jose Zamora is the son of the journalist Jose Ruben Zamora. He is currently the communications manager and impact officer at Exile Content Studio. For almost 10 years, he worked as the senior vice president of strategic communications and Univision Noticias. Thank you, Jose, for being here. Welcome. Thank you very much, Carmen. I'd like to thank all the panelists and ICFJ, the IAPA, and the Knight Foundation. Thank you, Jose. Carlos Dada is the founder of El Faro. This is a very important Salvadorian online newspaper. It's known for its investigations on, on organized crime, corruption, and violence. Carlos is one of the most recognized journalists in Latin America. Carlos, welcome. Hello, Carmen. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. 
it's a pleasure to be here with you and with such a distinguished panel to speak about what's going on with respect to most uh, to Jose Ruben Zamora, one of the most distinguished journalists in Central America. He is in jail, and that is what has brought us together to have this discussion. Carlos Jornet is the president of the Committee on Freedom of Press and Information. He is the journalistic director of the newspaper La Voz del Interior from Argentina, and um, we thank you very much, Carlos, for being here um, and for sending a message from the IAPA. Welcome to the panel. Welcome here. Thank you very much, Carmen, and I'd like to thank the organizers. We believe this is a very important issue. We need to shed light on that and keep shedding light on that so that this is on the international agenda. Undoubtedly, Carlos, and that's the idea to learn about the case. The people who have connected with us from Guatemala know about this. Uh, and those who are from other countries, we welcome you. Uh, from around the world. And I'd like to ask Jose Zamora, the son of Jose Ruben Zamora, to tell us uh, exactly about this case, what's going on. Tell us about it from the beginning, from uh, the moment when this situation arose, which led to your father being in jail. Thank you very much, Carmen. Uh, once again, thank you, everyone. Uh, well, I'll begin at the beginning, El Periodico and my father have been working for more than 30 years. And for that time, they have uh, been doing investigative journalism and uh, denouncing corruption. Unfortunately, in Guatemala and in many countries in our region, uh, the worst government is the one in power. In the case of the current government of President Jean Maté, Many investigations have been published during his administration. There's some interesting data that I just saw. There are 130 weeks of this administration to date, and a periódico has published 150 investigations of corruption during this administration. Everything got worse in November of last year when an investigation was published about a deal made by the president with a Russian company to uh, open a mine in Guatemala. This uh, contract, uh, well, with this Russian uh, company, while well, the company paid off the president. There has never been a good relationship uh, with administration, but that was really um, a crossroads. Uh, more investigations were published until 29 July. They put together a case based on um, facts that they have distorted. Then they added on um, tampered evidence that they fabricated. And with that, uh, they got a search warrant and they arrested my father. From the get-go, these proceedings have not complied with the legal requirements or the different proceedings. Um, there was a hearing at the end of the day. Um, six hours um, so that he had to spend the entire weekend in jail. And then the first hearing, which should have been 24 hours later, was not done until Monday. And then he was supposed to be taken from jail to the court. And they sent 20 patrol cars and a raid to his home um, when they had to transfer him. 
uh, to the court. There were no cars to, or vehicles to do so. They continued to prolong the process and his time in jail. And weeks and weeks go by and they use all kinds of tactics to keep him in jail. And finally, when the hearing was convened, uh, the defense attorney uh, spoke clearly. The Office of Public Prosecution does not have a case. They have very weak or null evidence, but the Office of the Public Prosecutor is trying to keep him in jail for three months and uh, to not give him alternative measures. Most people would be sent home under house arrest, but they're going to keep him in jail. And during this time, they also searched the newsroom of our newspaper or my father's newspaper. And then they also arrested on Friday the director of finance administration, Lucy Chai, to be able to understand more about what Jose is saying. Well, for those of us who have uh, been following this closely or not so closely, we've seen money and cash, we've seen recordings, we've heard things that need an explanation. We've heard a matter that is related to advertising with the newspaper, a, a businessman who wrote a check. Are these real facts that have been distorted to um, try to frame this case in a certain way. Thank you, Carmen, and thank you, everyone who's following us. I think it's important to highlight what Jose said. The Periodico has been working for 26 years. During those 26 years, they have been attacked by all administrations, but this administration has been worse because they have not been tolerant since Jamite took power as president of the Republic. He has been intolerant to criticism. He has not given any kind of statements. He only talks with the media outlets that support his point of view, and he has given no interviews to El Periódico. The attack has been systematic on El Periódico because of the oversight that they have exercised for years. And Jose talked about 130 articles. It's 137 weeks of this government. And every week we've been publishing investigations that have to do with cases of corruption. In other words, every week, not only have we been carrying out investigations, but in the national section, we have been publishing articles about cases of uh, corruption, um, different contracts given to friends or that are irregular. Yeah. I would just like to say that at least in 2003, and Jose knows this case very well. In 2003, they raided Jose Ruben's house and his family had to go into exile. In 2008, Jose Ruben was kidnapped, he was drugged, and he was left on a road far away from a city. It was He was thought to be dead until the fire, some firemen and a woman saw that he was alive, and he was taken to a hospital. In 2016, during Jimmy Morales' term, he had to also go into exile because there was some sort of plot against his life and against the life of the attorney general at the time, Mandana. He was seven months away from Guatemala, out of the country. And in the case of the Partido Patriota, it was also reported several times and denounced more than 100 denounces presented by the Partido Patriota. Now, in this case, Este caso del Ministerio Público en octubre del año pasado. We saw that the public ministry started this case in October last year. We denounced that the public ministry was building up a case and asfixiar al periódico. They were trying to target el periódico because they were trying to also target the advertising income that they were receiving. 
Enero, sí, en enero de este año siguieron. In January las... of this year, threats continued. Eh, eh, denuncias, de, o por lo menos nos llegaban datos que el Ministerio Público. We estaba... continue to receive information that the public ministry was developing a case against uh, José Rubén. Last year, more or less, on May 11th, one of our reporters and the chief of the newsroom and also Jose Ruben were denounced by the law against femicide and several measures were implemented against El Periódico to favor an employee from the Electoral Supreme Court. She is the daughter of one of the justices of the Constitutional Court. On, the, on May 22nd, Consuelo Porras, como Consuelo Porras was re-elected as a public prosecutor, and we denounced again that the public ministry was developing a case against El Periódico and that they wanted to shut it down on the 29th of July. Y se las del José Rubén Zamora's house was raided as well as the offices of El Periódico and they presented a case of money laundering. So far, as Jose has said, the defense has actually presented data against it and has managed to refute all arguments by the public ministry. There is no money laundering and there is no specific evidence by the public ministry to say or to have Jose Ruben detained or incarcerated. Thank you, Lucy. Carlos Dada from El Faro. You've carried out fantastic investigations about many different topics. Of course, you've been reporting about Jose Ruben Zamora's case. You've documented the legal process. You've investigated. You've published recently that the case was built in 72 hours. Tell us a little bit more about this, Carlos. Thank you, Carmen. Yes, we learned the case was developed by the special prosecutor against uh, impunity, Mr. Kurruchiche, that he had built the case in 72 hours. Why did we know this? Because he himself said it in a statement. He was explaining the case to us, and he said that 72 hours before Jose Ruben Zamora's was detained, he said, I had no clue of uh, Navarijo's existence. So in 72 hours, they developed a case of money laundering based exclusively in the statement of a single witness, Ronald Giovanni Garcia Navarijo. And that's kind of um, interesting, so to speak, to accuse someone of money laundering based on a single person's testimony by a person that had already been accused of money laundering with much more robust evidence. Money laundering is a very common accusation in Central America, increasingly common in fact. A few years, let me show, give you some data to show how much the situation has worsened in the region. Four years ago, our colleague Carlos Fernando Chamorro, director of El Confidencial from Nicaragua, organized in Managua, Four years ago, like I said, a panel with Jose Ruben Zamora and myself. Four years later, the three of us have been accused of money laundering. Zamora is in exile in Costa Rica. Jose Ruben Zamora is in prison now, accused of money laundering. And as it's been said, he had to leave the country for seven months. I've also had to leave the country for some time so that these new regimes that control the entire system in a very authoritative manner. In, in fact, they feel very proud of it um, to prevent them from developing these cases. In the case of Jose Ruben Zamora, the Guatemala's uh, prosecutors and uh, attorney general and the prosecutor, both of them are included in the Engel list and have been sanctioned, um, accused of corruption and obstruction to justice. Uh, for those that are here with us that do not Guatemala very well, I would like to provide a little bit of context about the situation in Guatemala and how it has worsened. 
lately because democracy and the rule of law has been very costly in Central America to see it um, fade away so fast. Guatemala hit bottom in 2004 when three PMs uh, from El Salvador were killed. They realized it was found out that it was drug traffickers that had actually carried out the killings. The government had no weapons and asked the United Nations or had no way to do anything and asked the United Nations to intervene. This is sick. The International Committee Against Impunity in Guatemala was created as a, as a consequence. It was made up of international justices and prosecutors to help Guatemala. They developed the Special Prosecutor's Office Against Impunity, and they started supporting different cases and build cases with the Prosecutor's Office, with Claudia Paz, y Paz and later on with El Mandana, both of them in exile right now. The, this commission was so successful that the previous uh, Guatemalan government, uh, Morales, decided to expel this uh, CICIG from, the CICIG from the country. The prosecutor's office was um, fired. The Sandoval remained as um, del sistema de justicia from us um, first chief. We have many of them in exile. Five of them are prosecuted and leading this entire attack against what the CICIG had built is Consuelo Porras and the new prosecutors and the new prosecutor Curruchite, the new head of the Special Prosecutor's Office, Rafael Curruchite. And again, they're both in a, a part included in the Eagles list which is a list that basically sanctions all corrupt um, public officers in Central America. It's very important to clarify this, to understand the origin and credibility of the case against Jose Ruben Zamora. If you want to later on, I can talk in general about the context in Guatemala, the dismantling of the rule of law and democracy in Guatemala for sure in the entire region, but specifically in Guatemala, you've explained the situation very clearly, Carlos Dada. The time the CICIG was in place was extraordinary for Guatemala in many different ways. Like you said, 24 judges and prosecutors were involved in this anti-corruption team are either in prison or facing a prosecution that justice apparatus has been dismantled literally in Guatemala. And today we need to wonder about the situation of uh, the justice system in Guatemala that is prosecuting cases. And in this specific case, prosecuting our colleague Jose Ruben Zamora. Carmen, I wanted to add something to what Carlos said. Regarding the repression, against the SIG and prosecutors that have worked on corruption cases. In the case of the SIG, when he was expelled from Guatemala, they were starting to investigate uh, President Morales. And then in the case of Yamate, when Juan Francisco Sandoval, who was the chief of the FESI, the unit that was investigating all the different corruption cases, and that's when the case against Yamate was starting to be investigated. And it had to do with vaccine, COVID vaccines and some suitcases with 122 million quetzals that were found. Uh, in these suitcases, and according to the investigation, it, it could uh, the president could be involved because the house where the money was found was a former minister of communications, and allegedly the government had promised the minister to keep him in his position based on that. At that moment, Sandoval decides to leave the country, the former chief of the FESI. Thank you, Lucy, for that clarification. Jose Zamora, let me go back to you. 
we journalists want to want to know more. We want to share with our audience and everyone who is here with us today. By the way, those are connected. We would like to invite you to send questions and to share also any comments you may have about what is being said here today and what is uh, about anything that is happening with the case of Jose Ruben Zamora in Guatemala. The International Center for Journalists is receiving right now all the questions that you're sharing and we will answer them during the panel. So we would like to invite you all to participate. Jose Ruben Zamora, we journalists want to know a little bit more about the case. We are seeing how El Periódico received money from a former banker, and now that banker is accusing Jose Ruben Zamora. We have this person's name is Garcia Navarijo. He is known in Guatemala, but we need to know a little bit more about who he is and what type of situation he, what's the context rather of your dad's relationship with this man uh, and also how El Periódico needs resources and how the El Periódico is open or not to donations, advertising. This part is, you, is what is being used for the prosecutor's case. Can you explain it? What is the relationship between Navarijo and your dad? What is the role that he plays? What is the plot of this story and the version of El Periódico? Okay, let me try to summarize a very complex story. As we all said before, and as Lucy explained, El Periódico throughout its history has experienced different types of attacks by the government. Defamation campaigns, fiscal terrorism, for example, they, they demand audits from government agencies, financial boycott threats, kidnaps, uh, attempts of martyrdom. Sometimes the government or the president actually calls executives from large businesses in Guatemala. And they, in this case, they did, and they asked them to not advertise their companies in El Periódico. El Periódico plays a key role in Guatemala's democracy. And many times businessmen want to support El Periódico, but they want to do it anonymously because they fear um, retaliation by the government. Let me provide you with an example. There is a developer in Guatemala and he was um, paying for advertising in El Periódico. The government called him and he said, please do not pay for advertising in El Periódico. He continued to do so. And what happened was that all his uh, building licenses were withdrawn for a year. So at the end, all the businessmen and advertisers basically decide that they want to support El Periódico, but many times what they say is, please, um, let, let's do this anonymously. Many times they do it through direct donations. But now there's a business person and many business people do this. Um, they give donations in cash to El Periódico so that the state doesn't know about it. This cash uh, that was received. And again, these are legal funds that came from a bank from the financial system. My father has to be able to deposit them into the banking system again. And that's uh, when Navarijo uh, is contacted. He was known because he was the manager of a bank, a bank that has had a relationship with El Periódico even before this man Navarijo was the manager and it still has a relationship with El Periódico and Navarijo said he could take this cash and write a check to my father so he could deposit that. Now we realize that was just a setup um, by the office of the prosecutor. Let me see just one second because this is key. Garcia Navarijo says I'll write you a check I help you to administratively process this check. 
So the idea of a check was uh, that of Garcia Navarijo. Do you know whether from the outset was he knowingly participating with the authorities from the Office of the Public Prosecutor? Now we've realized this is the case, yes. But my father had a relationship with Navarijo for many years because he had been the director of the bank when um, El Periódico used it. Also, because Navarijo was a source of information uh, for El Periódico. Also, on many occasions, because he worked for this bank and he had a financial institution linked to the bank, and they had provided loans to El Periódico. He had written checks for El Periódico. So there's nothing strange about the fact that my father would be speaking with him or that he would give him cash and that Navarijo would write out a check. Also speaking about money laundering. So that that crime exists, you have to have two things. First, the money must come from either uh, events or acts that are illegal. And in this case, it has been proven that these funds are from a bank. And this is something that the Office of the Public Prosecutor um, did. And it's interesting, the cash came with currency bands, which show that it came from a bank. And it even said what bank it came from on these bands. These original photos of when um, the money was received, well, we see the currency bands, but when the Ministry of Public Prosecution takes the money to the court, these currency bands have been taken off. What happened to these currency or money bands? And so we see that they have been tampering with the evidence. And of course, this is being used against my father in this case. So this does not comply with the first requirement for money laundering. And also when the cash was given and the check was written, that check is from a bank. In other words, funds from a bank uh, that would be deposited in another bank. And when the funds are going to be deposited, uh, it wasn't possible because the check came from an, an inactive account. So the funds were legal, they were from the financial system, but they don't comply with the second requirement. So money laundering exists. They had to come from illicit proceeds and from outside the financial system. So uh, this crime has not been committed. So uh, I see that these are real facts that have been distorted in order to um, set up your father. And then there's some recordings with your father, another voice talking about advertising, how to account for this money. What do you have to say about that? Well, that's one of these cases that I told you about. And that's an interesting case because the bank where Navarijo worked had a financial institution linked to Navarijo. At some point, a periódico wanted a loan from the bank, and Navarijo recommended to my father that instead of doing it with the bank, which is a more complicated process, that he get the loan from this financial institution. He got the loan and all the papers were processed, the loan was awarded. And then sometime later, that financial institution closed down. At that point, my father met with Navarijo but to tell him that he still owed money to the financial institution and we want to comply with our obligations and how do we pay off this loan? And that's when there's a recording and to say, how do we pay off this debt? And we're going to do so. Um, so that money owed to the financial institution, no one was trying to collect that money, but my father wanted to pay off the debt. That's why we have that recording. 
And uh, what the public ministry is saying that there's some blackmail going on, that my uh, father was uh, blackmailing Navarijo in exchange for something. And in these recordings, at no point does my father ask Navarijo to do something illegal or to have him give him something. And so he simply wanted to pay off a debt that El Periódico had. That money that El Periódico used to pay a journalist, or what was that money used for? The terrible thing about this case is that money uh, that uh, Navarijo wrote a check for that which was from an inactive account, well, that check could not be deposited. So Navarijo defrauded El Periódico. He took the money um, and wrote a check uh, that was bad. So those funds were to pay personnel, especially now in Guatemala. There's something that's called Bono Catorce. It's a, an extra payment that workers receive every year. And it was uh, to actually comply with um, these payments for personnel. And so then my father's put in jail, the accounts were frozen. Uh, and it's so impactful to see that the whole team, the whole newsroom of El Periódico continues to work. We are finding new ways uh, of working and new support for El Periódico, but a large part of the team has not been paid, but they continue to do journalism nonetheless. Well, this is so terrible, this money which uh, El Periódico got, Mr. Navarijo kept it. So many questions are coming in from uh, people who are connected from throughout the hemisphere and because they want to talk about Jose and Ruben Zamora's case. It's important in the whole region and in Guatemala. Lucy, questions, I have two for you. Something that we have to admire is that Despite this attack, El Periódico continues to reveal cases of corruption and follow up on Ruben Zamora's case. Lucy, are you afraid when you cover these cases? What are the risks you are facing? What are the investigations that El Periódico has revealed, which has led to these attacks on one of the most important media outlets in Guatemala and the most well-known journalist in Guatemala? Also, another question, are, are you fearful that there will be attacks on other media outlets and on other journalists? Lucy, what do you have to say? Well, the truth is the most difficult thing has already happened, and that was the imprisonment of Jose Ruben Zamora and the attack on the newsroom that Jose mentioned. Uh, we haven't been paid for a month, and the team in the newsroom uh, continues to reveal acts of corruption in the government. The day they searched Jose Ruben's um, house, it was uh, the last day of the month when companies uh, prepare to pay their workers. And due to that search, not only of Jose Ruben's house, but also the newsroom, payments were not made. Um, so uh, the personnel did not receive uh, wages and, and authorities uh, held people in the newsroom for 16 hours and uh, while they were searched on Saturday, that was a Friday, and on Saturday at 9 a.m., when the agents of the police and authorities from the public prosecution office left, um, everyone went home to rest. Sunday, they came back. Uh, well, the financial people came back to pay the personnel. And that afternoon, we began to have problems with the accounts. And 
Sunday night, Monday morning, we realized that the public prosecution office had asked for the accounts to be frozen. They thought that when they arrested Jose Ruben, that the team, they thought the team wouldn't continue to publish at Periodico. That was the idea to come into the newsroom to not have us publish, but we could um, publish more or less normally thanks to other newspapers that helped us print. We didn't print at our printer. We had to ask for help. And uh, even though a periodical usually comes out in the morning, usually, uh, well, at least by seven, we got the newspaper out. And on Monday, we saw that the accounts had been frozen. Last Friday, they withdrew that order and the accounts are now active. Uh, but we now have the arrest of the director of finance and administration and that delayed the payments again. Slowly, we're working on this. It's um, a hard, really a terrible blow to the newsroom and fear. Yes, we are fearful. Uh, but that's making us work, and that's why we've been working this whole time. 26 days since Jose Ruben was arrested, and we continue on. Uh, our conviction is that we must continue to work. We must continue to operate. We don't know how long uh, we'll be able to, but we believe uh, that this arrest is not just to arrest who, Jose Ruben Zamora, but to put an end to a periódico, a, a periódico which investigates corruption cases in the country. Um, we have been overseeing administrations for 26 years before Jose Ruben was arrested. Um, there were different defamation campaigns against journalists, journalists that had to go into exile, um, people who had to leave the country. This is just beginning. This is not ending. We are in an election campaign season. We believe the repression and pressure will be going up. It will be worse, not just against us, but all journalists. That's quite a complicated situation in Guatemala and throughout the region. Well, I just wanted to add something to what Lucy said. The, my father's case is, is not the only one that exists. This is just an example of what's going on in the country. This is a systematic undermining of democracy and of freedom of the press. Jamatei has persecuted activists and has been mentioned or justice officials who uh, were working on high impact corruption cases and now he's going after the press. This is an authoritarian regime um, and they're systematically undermining democracy. Without a doubt, uh, the whole region is facing this problem. Just in recent uh, days, we saw yesterday, for example, what happened against La Prensa in Nicaragua, in Mexico this week, another journalist was assassinated, Freddy Roman, he was uh, killed in Chimpanchingo. Uh, Carlos Dada, we see that uh, there are threats, uh, defamations, um, killings of journalists, and we see that presidents are saying that journalists are public enemies. Um, we also see assassinations, which are very serious. We see different uh, kinds of cases against journalists. And we see people being exiled. Many colleagues have gone into exile for reasons that you have already talked about. Carlos, you've been covering news in Central America like no one else. Can we talk about the situation in Central America? 
there is an attitude from power from um, governments that are too similar to each other and we see them over and over again yes thank you carmen for your question I think the objective is very clear in all countries that you've mentioned and in others in the region, Brazil, Venezuela, Cuba. We see an attack against the press and the intention is to stop an alternative narrative from the one shared by the government. Government basically are in the possession, have the truth uh, according to them and then no one else. Journalists need to have the, uh, the government be accountable, and we are just an obstacle, a threat. We see that there is a kleptocracy, and I think the case against um, Jose Ruben is, a, is proof that in Guatemala we have a kleptocracy, and this is not the only country. There are attacks against the press all throughout Latin America and Mexico too. In Guatemala, for sure, we see many journalists that are in exile or being prosecuted, many of them in prison, others uh, with um, open cases. In the case of the mine that was mentioned Jose, by mentioned Jose Zamora, um, it was a concession for the Russians. That was a very complicated case. Many uh, colleagues are in exile and others that were not so lucky are in prison without the due process, without a trial, without their relatives being allowed to visit them. In Guatemala, mm, the situation is very uh, dramatic because there's no newspapers. In El Salvador, there is a very strong attack against any type of narrative that goes against in the administration of Bukele. Mm, there is a journalist from El Faro who published yesterday an investigation about uh, uh, someone who, from the government who has mm, accumulated a big, a lot of wealth. Um, and now he's um, detained. So, Jose Ruben Zamora and the employees of El Periódico are very busy and very concerned about the release of uh, El Periódico instead of being worried about the, their job, which is to report and investigate corruption. Right now, Basically, um, they're threatening our sources too, and what they do is to attack the rights of citizens to be informed. They're attacking not only us journalists, they're attacking directly the right of citizens to be informed, to know what is happening with public monies. Mm, public money is not uh, does not belong to the government. is basically the fruit of the work of um, taxpayers. We are basically in a situation where we're seeing a de that democracy is being dismantled by authoritarian regimes. The final objective, of this attack is not to prove that Jose Ruben Zamora is involved in money laundering. The final objective is to silence journalists because our investigations directly affect the monopoly they have over power. Carlos Dada, yes, that is um, key to everything that is happening. We have a Guatemalan journalist now arrested for reporting as well as other journalists and we will continue to report about all this we have to open the discussion and understand how all this affects democracies societies people our fundamental rights the right to know the right to be informed the right to report by journalists and for citizens to receive that information free and public debate, all this that is affected when we see things as the ones we are seeing um, today that we are talking about here today. Jose Zamora, I would like to apologize because I should have asked, first of all, how is your dad? How is his health? That should have been the first question. Thank you, Carmen, for asking. He's okay. He's stable. 
he's strong. He really wants to fight and continue to report. He's writing a lot. He's been reading a lot. The very few times that we've been allowed to visit him, at the end of the visit, he basically gave us almost a, a book, a lot of um, things that he's handwritten. He's had a lot of time to think, to write. He is very frustrated, he's very angry, but he is posit he feels positive, he's feeling strong, and he's going to fight, and he will continue to report. At the beginning, um, his health um, was a little weak because part of all this was a psychological war against him. He was not allowed to sleep, especially right before the hearings. He was not allowed to sleep. A lot, there was a lot of noise throughout the night. Two days after being incarcerated, he was said that that hadn't happened in two years. Two days after he was put in his cell, it was full of bed bugs. And the bed bugs attacked him too. And, and that led to an allergic reaction. But little by little, he's managed to overcome all that. And now he's feeling strong and he's wait, patiently waiting. Jose, now um, at the end of the session, let me ask you something. This is your dad's case, uh, Jose Ruben Zamora's case. but. At the, uh, with this case, some sort of red line was crossed. The Guatemalan authorities crossed the red line because there are other cases with other journalists, other processes that are highly concerning and that we need also to mention. At this point, we are talking about the most important Guatemalan journalist, a journalist that is well known also internationally. Patrick mentioned all this. He talked about who, who Jose Ruben Zamora is, but basically we're saying that the most important journalist was incarcerated. But what else happened? What else happened before that? Basically, the message is uh, very clear. They want to silence the press. And it's very interesting because they've basically done everything they could to silence him and El Periódico. Like I said before, so far, there were two very extreme polls. One was defamation by the state, commercial boycott, fiscal terrorism, and on the other side, threats, kidnappings, and a, an attempt of murder. But they had never done this, which is basically to fabricate a case and put him in jail. And I think that sends a very strong message to journalists in Guatemala. And I think that is actually their goal. This entire, throughout the entire process, it's been very interesting to see how the state was focused from the get-go on trying to uh, make the case very public. From the moment that the officers arrive at the house, how he's taken out of the house, how he's taken to court, how he's taken to prison, to the hearings. Very strong, very clear images of the consequences of basically reporting, being a journalist. That's the message they want to share. I would like to ask panelists now for a very brief intervention. Lucy, very brief. This is, we have some final moments. What would you like to say now? In this case, we have seen the incarceration of Jose Ruben Zamora. Many attack Jose Ruben Zamora, but what they haven't realized is that the government is actually trying to kill 
um, media outlet. It's affecting us economically. It's affecting not only Jose Ruben, but a whole team of investigators that have worked for many years overseeing authorities. And the government right now has hit really hard. It's a very clear message against the freedom of expression, freedom of the press. It's a very strong message, not only for the press, but for all the people that would like to raise their voice against the government. As I said before, this is just starting. And if they did that to us in such a blatant way, they will do it against anyone who will criticize the government or raise their voice against the government in any way. OK, Lucy, what has happened with the advertisers that were using the New El Periodico to advertise their businesses? What has happened there? Are they staying? Did they leave? Or for Jose, is this, this question over to you? There are different situations. There are advertisers that are scared and withdrew from the El Periodico. They don't want to advertise their businesses. And there are other advertisers that are committed to the country, to democracy, and they've decided that they will continue to advertise their services in El Periodico. In addition to this, it's really incredible to see the international support that we're seeing from many organizations, media outlets, journalists. They're not only bringing visibility to Guatemala and the situation of El Periódico and my dad, but they're also helping El Periódico to organize itself to receive donations that will allow us to continue to operate. I think it's also incredible that through this process has been overwhelming, to be honest, citizens, in a, in a very positive way. Guatemalan citizens have supported El Periódico, have taken the streets, have demonstrated, have asked that El Periódico be allowed to operate, have asked that my dad be released. So we are seeing an incredible amount of support We're, uh, to El Periódico, and that's incredibly rewarding. Thank you. Thank you to those that have shared their questions and comments through the chat. We will not have time to answer all of them, but they are all there for those that would like to review. This is a debate. This is a discussion. We have to raise our voices and talk about this. Thank you to those that come from different countries. Clavel Rangeles from Venezuela. He's saying, Clavel is saying that persecution has increased throughout the region. How can um, all this have an impact on journalism in Latin America? We are suffering a lot of repression in the region. This government are putting a lot of pressure on, government, on journalists, Mauricio Canelas, Jose, will Jose Ruben Zamora's, uh, will he have a fair trial taking into account that justice is controlled by the state? These are among the questions that have been shared through the chat. Thank you very much for all those questions. I would like to read some of them now during our last minutes. Nancy Preto says, greetings from Panama. Jose Miguel Barrios is asking, what has been the reaction of advertisers of El Periódico? We've already read that one. We've already read about the one about the fair trial. Apologies, I'm having some trouble with my computer. I would just like to thank everyone for their messages. Carmen Flores, many comments. I, I would like to encourage everyone to continue to be involved in this discussion. Final minutes, Carlos Dada. What do you think we need to highlight in this regard? Thank you, Carmen. First of all, I would like to express my solidarity uh, to Jose Ruben's family and all the employees of El Periódico that are being criminalized or being affected. Mm, my solidarity my and my love to my Guatemalan colleagues. I just want to add one last thing. Sometimes we try to uh, keep very rigorous standards in the job that we do.
but our readers don't know about these standards or they don't really know how to distinguish between different types of journalism. For those that are not journalists that are here, I would like to share something. I think a media outlet that does not question um, the power, the government is not doing journalism, but propaganda. Because otherwise there's no balance of power. Because Many times the state wants to silence us and wants to replace us by propaganda apparatus. And we have to be very clear. We see in Costa Rica and other countries in the region that the power uh, that is the administration, we, they are trying to silence us. We're in the same situation. We're facing the same problem. So we need to organize and come together to fight this. Uh, we need to defend our right together. Um, I want to thank you, Carmen, and the ICFJ, um, I'm very honored um, to be here and to have received uh, or uh, the award from the ICFJ. Um, I'd like to thank Patrick also uh, for giving the introductory remarks. We'd like to end this program with closing remarks from Carlos Jornet. He's the president of the IAPA's Committee on Freedom of Expression. Um, so I'd like to know what you have to say about Ruben Zamora's case. Thank you very much, Carmen. The truth is, after hearing these statements um, uh, in first person, uh, it's so interesting, especially to hear the detailed explanation. When we heard about Jose Ruben's arrest, of course, we had to compare his case with other similar cases in Nicaragua, El Salvador, and other countries uh, that have uh, governments that have an authoritarian bent. Our reaction in the IAPA was immediate. We have no doubt that the aim of the judicial proceedings, which are uh, disproportional, well, the aim is to intimidate the newsroom of El Periodico and anyone who wants to investigate corruption, to investigate an alleged crime, uh, as Jose Carlos said, some provide uh, specific evidence. It wasn't necessary uh, to um, irregularly carry out a search warrants or to hold the journalists in the newsroom for hours or to freeze the accounts of El Periodico. The aim, again, was to intimidate free expression and to intimidate a periodico and media outlets. And so the strategy to strangle independent media outlets, which began in Cuba decades ago, and which has been promoted in Venezuela and other countries in the region since Hugo Chavez came into power, it has been perfected in recent times by uh, Rosario Morillo and Daniel Ortega in Nicaragua. So we have the governments from Managua, Caracas, Havana. This is the Bermuda Triangle where the free press is sinking. And this is seeping into neighboring countries, as Carlos said, El Salvador, Guatemala, but we also began to see concerning measures in the Dominican Republic, in Haiti, and even in South American countries where we see the situation or the situation in Mexico where there's ongoing stigmatization of the press to neutralize potential critics of the government in several cases that effort to silence the press and citizens 
is a model to strangle the free press. And so what we see is that they're following the Ortega model. They, I'm sure everyone knows what is going on in Nicaragua. What began in 2018, but it's been accelerated in 2020 during the pandemic. And in just a few months, it translated into repression that was unprecedented. For example, there were searches and seizures of media outlets that were so disproportional, uh, so public, just like the one case we're talking about here, um, convictions without evidence. Uh, for example, like the one that they're trying to do in Guatemala, Jose Ruben. We also had raids against the homes and headquarters of different journalists to try to get journalists to self-censor. Um, also repression against sources, limitations to have access to information obstacles for essential inputs, uh, financial strangulation, as Lucy has mentioned, persecution of journalists and uh, media executives. There are dozens of journalists and who have had to flee either legally or not to Costa Rica or other countries. At the same time, we've seen media concentration in the hands of the state or the family of those in power, like in the case of Ortega, and anyone who expresses criticism is attacked. For example, last week, uh, the radio station of the church in Nicaragua was closed. Uh, a bishop was arrested. Those of us who believe in the values of freedom and democracy, we have the obligation, we must be committed to raise our voices about the case of Jose Ruben Zamora. We must be heard throughout the hemisphere and beyond because I believe that you agree that search, that arrest, and that prosecution is just the beginning of the end of free press and uh, the undermining of democratic institutions. You know that the IAPA has been publishing the Chapultepec Index on the freedom of expression and press in the 2021 edition from last year. Guatemala ranked 17th uh, out of 22 countries, just above El Salvador, Brazil, Nicaragua, Cuba, and Venezuela who were at the very end of the ranking, but that meant it had fallen two places. Um, and I'm sure in our next edition that we're going to present next October, it will have also lost footing. And so these kinds of forums keep the international attention on these authoritarian regimes. And this goes beyond anyone's political ideology, right or left, autocratic regimes cannot be distinguished. Maduro, Ortega, Giamate, the regime in Brazil. And so supranational bodies must demand that these countries get back on the path of democracy and allow freedom of expression and press. I would like to thank Lucy and Carlos. Thank you, Jose, and the rest of you for your support. We hope to see your father free soon, Jose. Lucy, uh, we send our regards to you and all of your colleagues in the newsroom and uh, remember that we support you. Thank you, Carmen, for being a wonderful moderator. Thank you, Patrick, Luis, and everyone at ICFJ and our audience. 
and the IAPA is an ally and we will be raising our voice to defend those journalists who are persecuted and so I ask you to please fight back against this coalition of repression, this multinational repression. We are a coalition that is for freedom of expression in the press. Thank you very much, Carlos Jornet, for this message, this closing message. We thank everyone who has participated in this important debate especially at this point in time. Uh, it was very important to be able to connect and talk. Thank you, Patrick Butler, Luis Botello from ICFJ, Carlos Dada, Lucy Chai, and Jose Zamora, Carlos Jornet. And uh, I agree with what you have said, Carlos. And again, I'd like to thank our audience and have a wonderful afternoon. I hope to see you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.